Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of WealthQuest. I'm Alicia Sekum. Well, Africa has become the new investment frontier with global capital seeking to find solid investment ideas on the continent. But whereas extended data exists for South Africa, much of this is missing for other African countries. When engaging in company valuation, comparing an African player with its G7 peers may ultimately prove unhelpful as the underlying economies are so different. So how does one value a company? in Africa. Joining me in studio to give us analysis on the African markets is Godfrey Mwanza. He's portfolio manager at African Alliance. As per usual, our two guest hosts, Kwabi Lagrange, who's strategist at uh, Lucas Gray Investment Managers, and Roland Rousseau, who's equity strategist at APSA Capital as well. Welcome to you all. And I asked the question, uh, Godfrey, how does one do a valuation in Africa? It's not such an easy thing to do. Well, the interesting thing is I think the principles are the same in terms of valuation anywhere you're looking at, any market you're looking at. Um, obviously, there are some idiosyncratic differences with regards to the information, the quality of information that you get from some of the African uh, assets that are listed in, in our investable universe. But the principle is the same. And the, but the good news about the African space is that generally business models tend to be quite simple. So if you look at uh, in the banking sector, uh, what banks are doing is they'll take retail deposits and they'll lend it mostly to corporates and, uh, and buying treasury bills, so to the government. Uh, there isn't that, there's no CDOs, there's mm -hmm. no mortgage-backed securities that you have to unpack and understand. It's a very simple line of business. And then on the balance sheet side, the, the funding is, usually the leverage is much lower than what you'd see in maybe some G7 countries for, let's say, for commercial banks. And most of that is equity, sort of straight equity, no convertibles, no, no preferred stocks. So it's a much easier set of businesses to understand. And the same goes for, for non-financials as well. Obviously, you know, you have to you know, value it, but uh, the good news is that the business models are easy. Kobe, the simplicity takes you only so far, though, where you've got lack of information to contend with at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we tend to forget that a decade ago, only the brave went into Africa. You know, today, it's become an investment frontier where a lot of people want to be you know, wants, wants, want to be invested in. The problem that you've got in Africa is data. It's trying to find reliable data in order to understand what the fundamentals are that drive different businesses. They might be the same across different industry groupings, but certainly they could be slightly different uh, for a specific country, and obviously that needs to be extrapolated, obviously, as far as the risk premium is concerned for that, for that, for that uh, company, especially if you're a global asset manager and you're trying to obviously put a risk premium, so to speak, on a specific industry. Maybe just to show you um, how maybe similar or dissimilar these industries could be, have a look quickly at banks. I mean, we're looking at two different uh, concepts over here. We're looking at, in the blue bars, bank leverage, which is assets, asset, bank assets versus equity, and then the red dots are what we call bank liquidity, or the loans versus deposits. Now just look both at Kenya and Nigeria. Look at the asset to equity ratios, and here you can see them over there, which actually look quite similar to the United States as far as their asset to equity ratios are concerned. And then bank liquidity, which is loans to deposits, you can see run at about 84% for Kenya, 59% for Nigeria, and if you look at the United States, runs at about 92%. Now, that's quite interesting. I mean, those numbers, you know, especially when you look at those asset to equity numbers, look quite similar, but actually comparing them bank for bank won't actually help you. And by using American data and understanding, trying to understand the cycle of, a, of banking in the US, it's not really going to help you as far as the earnings cycle is concerned in, in, in some of these African uh, counterparts. So what are some of the stuff that you guys do when you look at a banking a banking company in one of these uh, one of these economies. Well, like I said, you know the asset to equity uh, ratio might be similar. For instance, with um, uh, I think it was Kenya and uh, and let's say the United States, but uh, sorry, not Kenya, Nigeria and the United States. But again, like I said, most of that equity is pure equity in the case of countries like Nigeria or countries like uh, Kenya and other African countries. Whereas in the states, you will have different components of that financing. So that equity w would be combination of like I said, you know, preference shares, uh, you know, convertibles, and so it's still easier looking at these companies in the Africa space. But the equation between what you should be valuing those assets or that equity at versus the returns that they make is still the same across the board, whether it's in Nigeria or whether it's in a G7 country. Godfrey, surely the, the biggest challenge here is to get the peer group right. In other words, when you're talking about valuation, you don't want to talk about uh, valuation in isolation is always going to be relative to something, right? So the valuation here is to G7, which we agree is, is very tricky. But uh, should you compare African countries and valuations to 
other emerging markets and we've got two options there we've got the large emerging markets and then the sort of frontier markets or the smaller emerging markets but surely the peer group is, is what it's all about yeah. well it, it's a good point that the from our point of view there are limitations to relative valuation and it doesn't matter whether you're looking at uh, you know Nigerian banks versus Botswana or Mauritian banks or Nigerian banks versus emerging market banks relative valuation tells part of the story but you can't end there uh, and the reason why, and we've got a graph that shows, um, you know, the difference in, let's say, price to book multiples uh, in different markets. The reason why is there will be a discount or a premium, but you don't know what that premium or discount should be, what the justified level of the discount or premium should be. So, for instance, Mauritian banks don't earn as high a return on equity as Nigerian banks, at least uh, in the in recent period, but they will trade at a higher multiple than Nigerian banks. And you would think, look, in Nigeria you have 160 million people, uh, banking penetration of about 40%, uh, potentially more growth there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and they earn more, so they, maybe they should tra trade at a premium, whereas they're trading at a discount. But the question is why? And logically you could probably argue that, look, it's a more unpredictable environment. But the question again still is, what is a justified uh, discount? Well, could we at this point, let's bring in that graph because we've got a graph that illustrates very clearly the challenge of relative valuations right now and speaks to exactly what Godfrey's been uh, chatting about. Mm. Let's, let's have a look. I mean, what are these graphs? And again, th these graphs today come uh, courtesy from African Alliance. You'll see return on equity and price to book values. And these are for financial services organizations, obviously on the continent and for some selected, uh, for some selected markets. You can see the straight line. Uh, analysis that have been done uh, if you just have a look at those and obviously what you would kind of think would happen is that the higher the return on equity the higher the price to book value of certain businesses would be and that obviously would be on that axis over there but look at Nigeria for instance it's a fairly decent return on equity but a very very low price to book value that means in essence investors are not rewarding these companies and these financial services organizations for the for the for the actual work that they're doing on the ground in order to actually create this return on equity. I mean this now comes back to equity risk premium and the country specific risk that you're assuming for being in some of these countries. The business model might be simplistic, but varying the country and the country risks might be more challenging. Is that not true? That is precisely the point. And you know the earlier question is what are the challenges that you experience with valuing businesses in Africa? Probably the, the biggest challenge uh, in my view is quantifying uh, that risk premium that is justified. Uh, the problem of course is even though you can measure uh, an equity risk premium maybe over using historical uh, returns over uh, risk free rates, there's a lot of subjective components that come into it and a lot of times people will add a premium that's based on an intuitive judgment about the risk of the uh, of the space. What's your assessment of where Nigeria sits on this graph right now? Because uh, looking at it, uh, you know, it's bucking the theory that uh, Kobe suggested, but you've got a player like Botswana that uh, follows very much in line with uh, with Kobe's theory. Well, how you account for it? Well, there are many different uh, explanations. I think the reason why uh, the Nigerian banks are trading at a discount, it, it's really one of two things. Either you don't believe as an investor that the Nigerian banks can continue to earn that 20% uh, or more, or you think that there's a much higher risk that should be applied to uh, discounting these, uh, these earnings versus a Botswana or versus a, a Mauritius. And that's what accounts for the difference. Mm -hmm. Roland, I mean, we've just seen what's happened in, in, in Egypt. I mean, three, four months ago, it looked like democracy was truly happening for this economy. Yes, there were some sticky points around the constitution and what potentially could transpire, but who would have thought four months ago that what is transpiring today in Egypt was actually going to happen and that it would potentially go back to military rule? Or for the first time, shall I say, go to, go to military rule. Um, how do you account for that from an investment perspective? Because it's one thing buying the company, it's a whole different thing coming up with that risk premium. What is that risk premium and how does one account for that from a global well, asset that, allocation perspective? Well, that risk premium has just gone up, right? We, th that's your sovereign risk premium that you have to overlay on top of the average company valuation for those markets. But it's not just sovereign risk, it's currency risk, it's uh, bond risk. So there are all sorts of credit rating kind of risks involved in these countries that all add up to an appropriate premium for that country. And maybe Nigeria has a lot more risks than some of the other countries and therefore people are not uh, willing to to pay up for that, for that risk. As you alluded to though, Godfrey, a lot of it having to do with subjectivity, a lot Correct. of it having to do with perception. Correct. I mean, Ernest & Young in their 2012 valuation survey where they surveyed uh, 38 uh, institutions that value assets in in Africa and these institutions included mining uh, houses, global banks, regional banks, 
70% uh, of them say they always use capital asset pricing model and they always use as a risk-free rate the, locally, uh, the local currency um, uh, risk-free rate or the government bonds. So if you're going to do, as, as Roland said, if you're going to add a country risk premium, there's another way of doing that. You use uh, a U.S. risk-free rate, and then you add country risk premium and so on. But if you're going to use the local rates, then it's a simple uh, observable fact what the risk-free rate is, what the equity risk premium is. But even on top of that, above and beyond that, there is the subjectivity of an added risk premium. Now let's maybe just quickly show you what, um, what, what we're actually talking about at the moment. And here, here you can see Nigeria, and this just shows you they all share return and there you can see it over there at about 16.2% per annum. That's obviously from 98 to 2013, which is a really respectable return as far as the equity market is concerned. Look at the average 10-year government bond yield. Now, we would assume that that would be the risk-free rate. So you could earn something like that by leaving your money in, 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 in the bond market. And then what is your equity risk premium? Well, it's actually 4%. That is what you actually get for going beyond the risk-free rate. Do you, would you say using credit rating agencies in African countries is worthwhile? Or is it better to go and do kind of actual at-country uh, analysis in order to understand what happens in these countries? Because you could do this for, uh, for G7, and you could potentially get a reasonable answer. And I'm not saying always an accurate answer, but certainly a reasonable answer. Could you do this for African countries? You can't do it for most of them. To do a credit uh, analysis or to do credit default spreads, uh, you need to have a sovereign that has a euro bond listed. And there are not that many that do that. I mean, Nigeria does have that, but that was since 2011. Whereas this data, in terms of local risk-free rates, goes back as far as 2007, which is not a huge track record, again, when you're comparing it to a G7 context. But uh, as far as an observable set of, of data points, it's much more, uh, I think, more credible to use that. How are you leveraging off the opportunity? How are we leveraging off the opportunity? Well, we're long uh, Nigerian banks. Long Nigeria, as simple as that. <laughs> well, you know, and it's, I think, you know, this is what I, I suppose if you're going to be a global asset manager and you're going to be in Africa, you have to understand the valuation challenges that are obviously within, within these economies. You have to understand that it has to form part of a collective, holistic mm -hmm. approach to asset management, not only from a global perspective, but that you've then got a certain portion of capital that you're obviously going to look at how you could potentially spend that the best in Africa. And quite frankly, being for the long run. And if you are, you're probably going to get some, see some decent returns. Yeah, very quickly, let's uh, flip over to that final slide that we've got. Yeah, let's have a look quickly. This is just, um, um, and uh, probably the best person to actually talk through this slide is, 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 is Godfrey himself, because there's a, you can see the market price to book value at 1.05, and then there's what's called an implied or justified price to book value. Um, just, Godfrey, take us quickly through the methodology there, how you get your justified price to book value for, uh, for African countries. Well, the textbooks will tell you that a justified price to book is a function of the return on equity and the cost of equity um, uh, of, uh, of the company. So if you take the observable numbers in terms of the risk-free rate, the equity risk premium that you just showed earlier, then you're looking at a cost of equity of about 17% for those banks and the beta, of course. Uh, and if you compare that to the sustainable ROE, and that's based on consensus estimates for what these banks on average can earn over time, then the justified multiple should be 1.27. The market is basically saying either the risk is higher or they expect the returns to be yeah. lower. And more often than not, it's because they think the risk is higher because I think there's some consensus about the earnings potential.